what are the kind of vulnerabilities or limitations of the metaverse? Because I'm sure we could all sit around here talking about all the all the great stuff that we love about it. I think as this thing shakes out, we're going to see politics play a role in the metaverse. I think when you start talking about the open metaverse, there's there's a lot of risk out there, and you know it's it's not necessarily a very safe place. Let's talk about the pros and cons of of these these two opposing worlds. Firstly, are they opposing? Is there a third way? Is there a hybrid um, between the two? Um, Aaron, you know, why can't we dismiss big tech? I mean, I, I feel like that's quite an obvious one at the surface level, which is that um, they have the users today. Um, and so being able to teleport users to their vision of what the metaverse is and have them feel somewhat that they've made that transition um, and maybe not know the difference between you know what we see as this open metaverse and what what um, will just be VR version of Facebook um, is something that's a big risk you know that's something they've got up their sleeve um, I think also they've got access to um, you know, political capital, which um, I think as this thing shakes out, we're going to see politics play a role in the metaverse um, because the true open metaverse is kind of about breaking down structures, um, whether that's um, ge 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 geographies or whether that's um, cultural or whether that's um, political or whether that's financial. Um, you know, the, the, the metaverse we all think about or we all kind of imagine is one that transforms the paradigm of society in a digital world and moves us from being, you know, tied to these very discrete um, ge geopolitical boundaries into something that is more, more akin to what the internet is designed for, which is an open space um, where people can participate from anywhere, no matter who they are. Um, so that is going to get political, I feel, because, you know, if you if you go down the real metaverse path, then you can start to see things like, you know, companies and countries start to be less relevant and probably the people in those power structures won't like that. Um, so I think those are probably the two big things. They've got the users, they can pr provide a UX that, that feels like the vibe um, and and they've got some political power. Yeah, and I think the political angle is, of course, interesting because, you know, with crypto today, I think there's already some various hearings um, uh, in the US where they've kind of had a number of crypto CEOs wheeled in, some who managed to tie their shoelaces appropriately and others that didn't. Um, and um, But they've made this case for why, you know, this is crypto generally, this economic system is perhaps not a threat. Um, perhaps it's a... It's a, it's a it could be a, an added benefit to more liberal, open democracies. Um, at the same time, you know, if if we've read the versions of science fiction that describe the metaverse, for me, one of the things that always stood out, whether it was a dystopia or not, was that somehow the metaverse subordinated nation states. This idea of nation states became uh, irrelevant. Um, and as you say, even structures like corporations, what is, why would you organize within within these kind of very industrial um, kind of groupings? Um, yeah, the industrial like, revolution really has, you know, since that time, we haven't really seen um, an evolution at all in any of the structures that sit behind society, whether that's education, whether that's politics, whether that's, um, you know, corporate structures. And now we've got this, you know, near bedrock, bedrock of technology that allows us to do things in an internet native way. And I think it's clever or naive of those CEOs to position it as a non-threatening thing. Um, it's clever because if they're smart, they know that it is a threat and it's naive if they think it's not. Um, and it's also naive to believe that, you know, um, large, powerful democracies really want true democracy. <laughs> um, and, you know, and that that's a bit of a meme in itself. So the idea that, you know, crypto can help them extend 
true democracy to the world is probably a scary one because that's not the kind of democracy they want. And at the same time, you know, look, governments, large states, big, big state has this love hate relationship with big tech. Right. On the one hand, it's already been, you know, feels threatened by the idea that these things are in a way um, their own kind of sovereign economies, their own sovereign states, sometimes with populations and GDP more than um, many countries. Um, at the same time, they can, of course, be easily captured. Right. And so uh, if they're looking at the alternatives of this unpermissioned economy, the open metaverse and then big tech, which they, they love to hate, but that could be easily captured. You can imagine which one they're gonna they're gonna pick. Yeah, exactly. We, we've obviously started off with all the light stuff, right? I mean, Jesus, so I don't know <laughs> how, how how we're gonna end this. Um, but but okay, we, we've got we've gone really big. Geo, um, what are so if we if we then say okay, that's big tech. You know, it's got great UX. It's got billions of users. It's um, it's government friendly. It's you know state friendly um and now we've got the open metaverse today what are the kind of vulnerabilities or limitations of the metaverse because i'm sure we could all sit around here talking about all the all the great stuff that we love about it and why we want it to exist but is that not just being utopic what's the reality of the open metaverse today and its limitations i mean i i think you know what people like facebook and epic games and all these bigger entities kind of have in their favor right now is like everybody knows how to go to facebook make an account, sign in. Like my mom uses Facebook religiously and it's like, it's just, it's got the whole demographic covered as far as ease of use. Uh, I think when you start talking about the open metaverse, there's there's a lot of risk out there. And you know, it's, it's not necessarily a very safe place for the people who are not completely, um, you know, up to speed on best practices. And, you know, we, I think crypto and, and people working on the open metaverse, like we've got a long way to go to make it, um, convenient like you want to have people opt in to the open free metaverse but like a lot of people aren't going to do that at the expense of significance of ease of use and just safety you know i think the idea of having your wallet drained or, or any of these other things that you hear about on a daily basis like we've got a long way to go to um to normalizing i think just best practices and i think also just like just the design of a lot of these protocols and the things that are being developed, like they're they're designed in, you know, for the people that are pretty familiar with this stuff already. Um, so I think we, we can use uh, a little bit more work there, but um, I think people are always gonna want, or at least a lot of people are always gonna want to opt in to the open and free metaverse because we've kind of seen what all these guys did the first time around. Um, and, you know, there's an opportunity here to like have our own and I would hope that like, you know, as these bigger companies start to pivot, people working at Facebook are like, well, why don't I just go do this with people like Aaron? Uh, and, you know, hopefully we can kind of steal some of their best and brightest minds to, uh, to build something a little bit better. No, don't steal any of my brightest minds, please. But, um, but that's, you know, that's Facebook. a good point about UX and it, it is probably, you know, the number one weakness in the current system and i feel like as an industry we have to come together and coalesce around standards you know and have you've got we're because it's early days we've got all this fragmentation right there's like different chains and there's different wallet standards and there's different um token standards and so all of this fragmentation actually leads to well, and on the good side, it's innovating quickly and we're weeding out like it's the evolutionary path. And that's one of the great things about this Web3 space is that it evolves quickly. On the bad side, you've got this fractured user experience and, you know, asset portability is bad and all of those kinds of things. So I think like us as an industry to, to kind of counter the UX problem is to start together to organ get together to organize standards for this stuff so that we can get... Um, you know, common user journeys throughout each of the products or each of the underlying protocols or each of the underlying networks. And that will then lead to overcoming that UX problem. Yeah, and Gio, it's interesting you use the word safety because actually I, I listened several times to Zuckerberg's roadshow um, and safety was the most frequently used word, right? Um, yeah. Because of course that's playing to the fears. It's it's playing to concerns of regulators. 
Um, but it's interesting to understand actually what is the definition of safety. Um, well, it's kind of that. Own any of those assets, what can people steal anyway? Um, so it's like, what are they? What yeah, are they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, everything's so safe because we don't we don't give you control of it or ownership, so <laughs> you don't have to worry about it being stolen. Um, so Rahila, you know, if we talk about you know you you are uh, an investor in founders, and you know you hear startups, projects, protocols, whatever you want to call them, uh, like Aaron, like Fluff World, uh, like Altered State Machine, and they have different go to markets. So they generally speaking want to be as decentralized as possible, but at the same time, you know, they're trying to find product market fit. They're a startup, you know, they are trying to iterate quickly, figure stuff out. So how do you think founders can reconcile that tension between being a startup and being decentralized? Well, I think Aaron's done an amazing job. If you saw Angel Baby perform at um, Fluff House and at Art Basel, and they'll be performing again in um, in Los Angeles soon. And then I think yeah. it's South Southwest. So kind of hitting all the major places where there's people that are really curious about understanding the technology. And it was really amazing to see kind of Fluff World start from the very beginning to seeing such a huge audience of people that knew about fluffs and were there to see angel baby which is a relatively new metaverse star and then i was able to um we filmed angel baby's performance and then just being able to connect with the team behind it to see that it's like you know really amazing people that worked with um a-list musicians before and they want to create a meta star in the metaverse, but in a decentralized one. And they're working with the founder like Aaron that's based in New Zealand. So I think that that's been pretty amazing to see like this literally like global collaboration across continents. That's like not easy to do. 